Uh, welcome any, everyone, uh, really appreciate you signing into this webinar. Um, so today um, our guest is Sam Bolle from Chelsea FC. Um, I'll let him introduce himself, but he'll be talking about implementing uh, velocity-based training in professional soccer. So it's a real pleasure to have him. Um, just before we get started with Sam, uh, we have a lot of people uh, signed in. I mean, there's almost 500 people signed in now. Um, so any questions that you have, what we'll do is if you could please write them into the Q&A section, you'll find the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, any questions that me and Bailey can um, answer on behalf of PUSH, we'll do so during the presentation. Um, any other questions that are directed at Sam, we'll wait until the very end and then do a Q&A um, session with him. Uh, so without further ado, Sam, take it away. Thanks a lot, Cedric, and welcome everyone to my webinar. I hope you're all well. Um, it's nice and sunny here in the UK, so uh, we've been enjoying the weather, even though um, of these unusual circumstances with lockdown. So my webinar today, just talking you through um, implementing VBT in professional soccer. So outcomes from today. So I'm going to just talk you through uh, why we are currently using velocity-based training. How do we implement velocity-based training within our strength programs? I'm just going to talk you through um, and identify a typical week for some of the academy players. So kind of what happens during the week, how do we schedule the strength sessions in and around um, training and matches. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about coach and player buy-in, which I think is really, really key in the SNC world. I'm sure we've all had our sort of problems with this before. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about education and culture, why I think it's important um, and how we try to implement it within the programme. And then just talk about some remote coaching, um, not just in this current situation, but just how we've used it before, um, especially in, in terms of things like the off-season and, and stuff like that. So I just want to kind of go over quickly. Um, you know, you've heard the old saying of more than one way to skin a cat. So I think this is um, it's quite a good example um, in the world of SNC. There's there's so many great practitioners out there um, doing some some great things and using different methods. Um, and there, there's no sort of like um, you know one trick that fits all. So this is just one example of how we or how I've used the, the type of method and how we've looked to improve the strength, speed and power of our athletes. Um, I'm not saying this is the only way and um, there's so many great ways out there to do it. So again, this is just one example. So why do we use velocity based training? So we wanted to uh, train smarter. So with the new technology out there, with the feedback that it started to give us, um, we feel as if we could we could train a lot smarter with what we're doing. Um, some of those reasons I'll go over as the presentation goes on. We also wanted our players to work along the force velocity curve. We wanted to expose the players to working at sort of um, high force outputs um, using max strength and then working down that curve, adding in more speed with a bit more power, uh, exposing the, those, uh, those players to those exercises. We wanted to create some good player buy-in as well. Um, we wanted to use some fresh new technology within the gym, um, which is why we kind of looked to train with push to see what we could do with that. We wanted, wanted a competitive edge. We want the boys to push each other. So, you know, I don't know about you guys, but when I'm in the gym, just I always want to sort of better myself. So with that use of technology, we felt as if we could push each other, we could push the players. Um, and we did actually come up with a really, really good competitive environment. Within that competitive environment, obviously, we're quite a high performing environment. So, you know, we wanted to make sure that when the boys are in, in the gym, when they're working, they come in and, and they work to their full potential when the time was right. And also with the use of velocity based training, we looked to minimize fatigue. So we didn't want to, to really push the boys, you know, over that kind of barrier, over that threshold bearing in mind that they had to train on field every day um, and with obviously busy uh, game schedules ahead. So how do we use velocity based training? So <sighs> some of the examples, so training targets, we look to use training targets. Um, we, we try to kind of target the speed zones along that force velocity curve um, and also looking to reduce fatigue in any way um, or, or that we could. 
With the velocity-based training or push bands, um, there's some objective measurements. So we had the measurements and we were able to kind of, you know, give some feedback to the players, feedback to the coaches, not just only in the gym, but you have various meetings with coaches. They always want to know how, how is the player doing? How are they improving? So with this data, we were able to use that. Straight away from a testing point of view, um, we were able to sort of predict some one RMs, um, which kind of based our programs. So um, baseline measures at the start of a program and then retesting again to see if the players have improved. We were able to track over time as well. So each session that we did, we could have a little look back. We could have a little look back at the exercises they did, um, the quality of those reps and sets, and also tracking across time. So are we lifting the same load? If we're lifting the same load, is the velocity getting quicker? Is the player getting stronger? So I'll show you some of those examples a bit later on in the presentation. <clears throat> in terms of exercises, so mainly looking at the concentric phase. Um, so sort of from a max strength point of view, slow, heavy strength, and then moving again down that curve into the more sort of fast, explosive power exercises. So this is just um, a little diagram of the force velocity curve. So there's loads of different diagrams out there available on social media, on the web. Um, this is just one that we kind of developed ourselves. Um, again, probably, probably mainly to educate the players. So at the top of the curve, you've got the force. So when you apply sort of high forces, you're going to get very sort of slow velocities. So this, the velocity thresholds that we were kind of training with anything below 0.5 meters per second. So that was our kind of target range. Um, this isn't a set curve. I know the coaches like to adapt um, their, their uh, FV curves. Some people like to just go purely strength, speed and power into three areas. I know there's um, some, so I've seen some coaches that have split these kind of sub, subcategories into a little bit more detail. Um, and they like to sort of maybe one week they work on one speed and then they kind of get slower or faster, it just depends on the, the individual athlete as well. So at the top, like I said, you've got the force, you've got the max strength, and then working down that curve, as you start to add a little bit more speed, we call that the strength speed. Okay, so velocity slightly faster, so 0.7 to one meters per second, we're looking for the bar to move or the body to move. As we come down, that starts to add a little bit more velocity. Um, that's normally known as speed strength, so a velocity of 1 to 1.3 meters per second. And then when we're taking away that high force output and we want just pure velocity, pure speed, um, we're sort of looking at anything over 1.5 meters per second. So this curve, we showed this to the players in the gym, and this is where I'm going to talk about the education with the players. We really wanted them to understand where they are working. So in terms of programs that we're giving the players, Okay, player X, we're going to be working on some max strength. Okay, and then we can go into the detail of how we're going, going, going to achieve that goal, how we're going to really improve the strength for that player. And then once that phase kind of finishes or comes towards the end, we might uh, review it, we might reflect on the practice. Again, this can be done with the player. And then we kind of go, we've done some really good pin there, we hit some good outputs, we're confident through testing that we've got stronger. Now can we start to add a bit more sort of speed, a bit more power? Can we improve that rate of force development? And can we get the player quicker as well? Just in terms of periodization, so for those of you that don't know, um, in elite football, it's a, it's a very, very kind of competitive, hectic schedule. Um, we have lots of fixtures within our, within our age group. Players are constantly being pushed to perform on the field. Um, so with all the fixtures across many competitions, it is very difficult to try and get um, some good quality gym sessions in. Um, we always kind of, we always wanted to try and load the players um, in any way that we could. So um, in terms of loading, it's not, I'm not saying it's really heavy loading, but it's just what kind of strength stimulus can we give that player? So within this busy schedule, somewhere can we try and, um, provide the minimum dose of strength. And that was the question that we gave ourselves, is no matter what was going on, how many games the player was playing, the training schedule, whether it was you know, more recovery within the program, could we get some, some strength exercises in there, so the minimum dose required. 
And that is one of the things that we wanted to do this season. So in terms of that minimum dose, the options available. So we wanted to continue to lift during busy game schedule. Now, I know that some coaches might want to go, do you know what? It's too busy. Let's just kind of leave the strength stuff. But for me, there's, there's always ways that we can do it. And it doesn't always have to be in, in the gym session. It might be little things within the prep that you're doing in the morning before training. It might be kind of little bits of the warm up, warm up that you're doing. So just real simple. It might be some rear foot uh, split squats in the warm up, etc. But you're, we're still getting that minimum dose. In terms of using the push bands or using the velocity based training, we looked at velocity loss. So um, we kind of encourage our players to lift as, as best as they could. We obviously understand that they're going to be fatigued with all the busy games coming in with the high outputs that they're putting on the pitch. So we would get them to kind of like reduce their lifting or stop lifting um, once their velocity dropped below a certain speed or percentage. Within the season, obviously you're going to get breaks. You're going to get some international breaks where not all your players go away. There's going to be some kind of weekends where there's no game. So um, we kind of felt to, to cash in on, on the players. Um, so cashing in on a session is just kind of where within your schedule can you really look to kind of uh, challenge your, your player? So do you know those, those sessions where you go, right, there's no game coming up this week. So we're going to have a, a two or three really good strength sessions. And we know the quality is going to be good. We know the player is not going to be too fatigued. Um, or they're not going to be, we're not going to worry about fatiguing the player too much because there's no game coming up. So it's a real chance to take advantage and get some good gains in the gym. And also we still wanted to expose, uh, expose those players um, within the force velocity curve. So we might reduce things like um, volume of training. We just might reduce the intensity again, used with the bands. And just talking through kind of, um, if, for those of you that don't know, in terms of our, our football season. So the June is kind of um, the off season. So the, the players, we might just give them some, uh, some generic maintenance, some strength maintenance. We don't want them to completely stop. Um, we like to use the sort of equaliser example where maybe the on-field uh, training comes down, but we might just kind of turn up um, the volume of the strength training there um, and sort of get some maintenance in there just so the player isn't stopping. And also when they go back into doing some, some strength exercises, as you all know, that when you stop doing something, it's quite difficult to get back into it. You can get some heavy doms, the adaptation comes in again. So. Um, that off season is just a little bit of maintenance as we move in towards July. Um, so we go for the pre season. So that's where uh, the on field intensity kind of goes up again because they haven't been on field for a while. So that kind of change in team training, that change in intensity and volume comes up. So we don't want to hit them too much or too hard with the, the strength work. So we might just give them some general strength exercises, a lot of variety, really challenge the core. Um, and again, just little minimum doses here and there so that they can cope with the on-field training. And then moving into the season, so within football, we don't like to stop, um, like I said before, with the busy schedule. So the phases that uh, we like to kind of set out or I like to set out were the first sort of three months, really build a good foundation with the max strength. So you've got all your new players coming in. Um, obviously, after testing, you know where the players' weaknesses are, you know where their strengths are. Um, but as a foundation and from probably an injury prevention point of view, can we just get those players strong straight away? Now, you know, you may be thinking, OK, get them strong. Does that mean really, really heavy lifting or you know, load them up? Well, we don't necessarily mean that. It's just getting them strong. So no matter how you decide to measure your players, um, what kind of outputs you want. Again, with using the push bands, we are able to kind of train at um, the right level, train smarter, making sure that we weren't pushing those players. Um, and hopefully by then, <clears throat> by the sort of in-season when it started, they would have adapted to the on-field training and they would have adapted to the off-field training as well. So that sort of three-month period, we really took our time, um, the max strength. And then going back to the force velocity curve, just moving down, spent some time on the strength speed. So um, moving those, those loads a bit quicker, just gradually adding in some speed and reducing the load. And then towards uh, the end of the season, is more the kind of speed element. And I think that really, um, that kind of fits in quite well towards the end of the season, because normally, traditionally, that's where you have, it's a final push towards the end of the season. 
Um, you've got a lot of games coming in if you're still in all the competitions, so you can actually reduce that volume or that, that lifting element and then really concentrate on just some good quality speed work to kind of um, just keep their speed qualities going. In terms of the typical weeks of so just breaking down the, the season, then into the week. So we would normally have a couple or, or maybe three or four different types of, of week within, within football, within our, our age group. So the top one there is just a typical Monday to Friday training week with a game on Saturday and then off on Sunday. So depending on the age group that your team plays in, sometimes you might have your game on a Friday, you might have it on a Saturday. So within that, that first uh, example of the week, uh, we would look to, to lift as further away from the game as possible. So our kind of our main strength session, our lifting session would be on that Monday. Um, and if we were to kind of work back, that would be sort of like two days after the last game. So second day recovery would be our, we'd always lift on that, on that day there. Then on the Tuesday, um, we still want to try and get in some strength work, but we might just kind of like move away from the heavier, heavier strength and do some more speed strength exercises. So even if we're still work, even if we were still working in that first phase, that max strength phase, we'd almost want to work al alongside it just with some um, just some speed exercises in there as well. So they kind of complement each other. And also, I found in, in football that the coaches are, are trying to get their players as, as good as they can, as quickly as they can. So sometimes it's difficult to, to kind of persuade them, right, coach, I'm going to be working on just max strength for you know, the first three months, but really you've got a player that needs to get a bit quicker as well. So that's where we kind of complemented the two, two parts of the force velocity curve in there as well. So we'd have two strength sessions in that week we'd have a strength session and a speed strength session and again I think it keeps it quite fresh for the players they're doing something different they're working on a, a different part of their force velocity profile on different days um, some players so I know some coaches like to split up that week and they like to go upper body on one day lower body on another day then back to uppers again we would just probably do three sessions within that that kind of Monday to Friday or that five game that five training day model um, within that first example, you might just chuck in some upper body and core as well in there. So you probably see pre-training in there as well. So that's something that we're massive on. So prep work. So again, that's where you might still chuck in some strength exercises. Again, just minimal dose. So the player is actually exposed to a lot of athletic development, which is one of our goals is they're getting some exposure within the prep sessions and they're getting some exposure in the strength sessions in the afternoon as well. So it would normally work that they do the prep session, go out and train and then have lunch and then they do their, their strength in the afternoon. And obviously within those three sessions there, Monday to Wednesday, all, this, all the work is kind of done as far away possible. So within the first three days um, of that week and furthest away from the game. So the kind of like underlying theory is that when they come round to the game on Saturday, they're nice and fresh. Their strength work has kind of been um, sort of backlogged to the start of the week. Um, we probably see them now on the Friday session or the, the minus one day that we like a bit of perhaps, so um, post activation potentiation. So again, you know, another little way of just getting a strength session in there. So if you look in there, they've actually got, you know, four, four strength sessions in there um, if, you, if you don't count those prep sessions. So within that kind of typical week, the players do get some good exposure. Now, when other games come in as well, so that's where you have to be a little bit clever with your, your planning. So if there's a game on the Tuesday and the Saturday, as you can see in that bottom table, you kind of have to think, right, where can we fit in our, our strength sessions? So that minus one day, again, do a little bit of pack work, which might include um, some explosive work, like some pogos or some med ball throws, some slams might do some barbell counter movement jumps um, and obviously a game on Tuesday. Wednesday might be off or if there is another game come on Saturday, um, that might be a recovery day. And then again, still looking at that second day recovery, they've had two days to recover from the last game. So we would do a, a strength session in there depending on the phase of training that we're working in. Um, and then we might just reduce the volume of, of, of that session. So rather than doing three or four sets, we might just do two sets because again, that's what we kind of think to as being the minimal dose there. And again, leading up to the game, 
another pap session, and then going into the game there with Sunday off. So that's just two examples of, of our weeks that, that we have in football. Um, obviously, it does change in certain leagues, etc. There might be three three games in a week. So again, it's just how you adapt and how you plan and how you get your training sessions in. So in terms of baseline measurements, again, loads of different ways that you can collect your data. This is just one way that we use the, the bands to, um, to collect some of our uh, predicted 1RM. So our KPIs, uh, we, we kind of used our core lifts within the gym. So each program that, that we did, we had our uh, sort of couple of exercises where we used the bands and we, we, we used our core lifts um, to try and test the guys. So our first phase, um, our upper body testing was, was bench press. Um, and we also used the trap bar. I kind of feel that the, the trap bar is just such a good uh, bang for buck exercise for kind of lower body strength. So those are our two testing measures that we use at the start of the program. Um, uh, these were obviously predicted from, from the bands, but they gave us uh, the information moving forwards. So once we had those measures, we were able to go with the coach, go to the coach, go to the player. This is where you're at. And then this is moving forward, how we're going to do it. This is how we're going to train you. We're going to test you again and we're going to sort of look at that feedback and we're going to see have you improved from, from the training that you've done. We try to test every month. Now, obviously, again, with a busy schedule, it is difficult. Some days we, we missed a month depending on, on games. We've had loads of games. We, we you know, weren't able to do it. I must say with, with the push bands, they were really, really quick um, to do within a whole group. We were able to maybe have two or three staff around the around the testing players whilst the other players got them up some other sort of um, accessory exercises as well. In terms of testing, so I know there are offers, um, you can test the back squat, you can test bench press, you can do some CMJs, um, track bar or traditional deadlift, um, and you can also set up your own tests as well. So um, we just kind of felt that whatever we were training, that is how we were going to test it. So for example, if we were going to be testing their trap bar, we'll be training on trap bar. If we're going to be testing bench, uh, we'll be training on, on the bench as well. Um, and as we kind of worked along the force velocity curve and we added the new exercises, the kind of versa versatility of the band is you could, you could kind of test in different ways. So and another example, moving towards the speed element of the curve, we, we use the drop jump, looking at explosiveness um, and stiffness of the, of the tendon. So we were able to use the push band around the waist to look at how quickly they were getting off the ground there. Um, so again, it gave us loads of different options that we could use. So using the band, so these are just some examples of how we, how we use them this season. So for the max strength, like I said, said to you, our key lifts were the bench press and the trap bar deadlift. When we moved towards the sort of strength speed uh, part of the curve and the, and the velocity zones, we looked at the trap bar jumps, okay, so kind of um, bracing yourself on the trap bar, jumping up as explosively as you could, so making that concentric part of the, of the lift really, really explosive. Um, still had a little bit of weight on there, so still a kind of moderate to light weight on there. Um, and we also used for the upper body the bench press throat, so really pushing nice and explosively, letting go of the bar at the top of the lift and then just catching it. So I think within the those first two phases, um, you may be thinking, okay, exercises are the same, but we, we kept the exercises the same, but we just changed the emphasis. Um, again, education, just teaching the players that how you could use the same exercise, but still train in a different way. I think that was really important for us. And then when we moved towards the, the more sort of explosive speed type movements, the speed strength end of the spectrum, we started to use um, some more unilateral exercises. So we started off with some bilateral strength, again, just building that foundation into the more sort of unilateral um, exercises as well. So obviously football is, is, is played on one leg. There's lots of unilateral work in there. So we decided to kind of expose the players to that as well. So in terms of the dumbbell split jerk, so an example using the band might be putting the band around the forearm. So just that, you know, concentric peak velocity that we're looking at moving um, that dumbbell as quickly above the head as we could and then the single leg barbell step up just placing the band on the barbell um, and then just quickly driving up um, which kind of links in with force into the ground and things like that. Um, towards the sort of faster end of the, the curve, the speed, so like I said to you about the drop jump, um, 
we had the, the band around the waist, so looking at speed off the ground, um, and then some med ball throw work. So some really, really good ballistic work in there. Again, use the band on, on, the, on the forearm, just looking at how quickly the players could move it. Um, I'd probably say the band's featured heavily or featured the most within the max strength phase. Um, and we tried to just kind of attach it to two exercises only. We didn't want to complicate the gym session. So we wanted the players to get really focused and really strong in a couple of lifts. And then they obviously had their accessories afterwards as well that we kind of felt that we, we trusted them to carry on with that when, when they could. Um, so a lot of the coaching focused on those two kind of core lifts just so that we could ensure we were getting some really good quality from those. Another example of where we used it, we used it in the PAP sessions, as, as you saw from the little tables of our, of our typical week examples. So examples where we used it for the PAP. Um, again, we did some medball slam work. We did some, um, some counter movement jumps in there. Again, just kind of players coming in, finding a name on the iPad, doing their exercise. Um, it might have been a squat jump, or it might have been a quick counter movement jump. And then the next player coming in going, like, can I beat that score? And then you know that you've had really, really good intent for that session and the players aren't just coming in and kind of doing their exercises willy-nilly, um, but they're getting some good quality. And then you know that you're kind of hitting the right targets, you're hitting the right goals going into training um, if it's from that kind of correct point of view. And like I said before, just similar exercises, you're changing the emphasis on there. So just going into how we set up a session. So... Like I said to you before, we had a couple of bands going um, and I like, the way I like to do it is just work in sort of groups of three and four. We probably had no more than, than maybe eight to 10 players within the group. Um, that was with two coaches in there. So I thought that ratio worked quite well. Within that kind of working uh, group, we had obviously the guy working, we'd have spotter, and then we'd have the guy resting um, and the guy resting might be holding the iPad or just kind of feeding back their, their kind of um, their scores from their lift. So it's quite important, I think, that the player is not concentrating on the screen itself, even though you can probably see from that picture there that they, they're looking right at the screen. Um, we kind of played around this a little bit. So if you had one player just um, holding the iPad and, and feeding back the, the data from it, or you could have had them looking at it, but we kind of felt, right, you focus on your lift, you focus on bracing for that exercise or the kind of key cues that you need to do, and then you've got your, your buddy or your partner just to kind of help you out with that little bit of feedback. And then we try to encourage them to kind of um, really push each other as well. Um, and traditionally, we, we use large, we did use large kind of gym circuits, um, so maybe six to eight exercises, players going in, um, completing the, the program or the, the stations in any order they wanted to. But we found that it just happened really, really quickly. And again, players would come in, complete the, the circuit, and they would be done and they would be gone. And we didn't really kind of feel as if they were getting any quality from it. We didn't feel as if we were able to coach the players because they kind of knew what they were doing. They came in, they did their exercise. They were probably lifting the same weights as what they did in the session before. And we just didn't feel as if we could get much quality out of it. Whereas if we broke this down into kind of like mini circuits, so three to four players or three to four exercises, we found that it worked really well. So they were taking a little bit more time, a little bit more care. And obviously they were having a bit more rest in between so that when they did go and lift, when it was their turn, the quality was much better. And I've just put that little quote in at the bottom that I read in an article is if we change something too frequently, we may never get good at it. So that's why we decided to stick to these exercises um, and obviously do the same exercises, but change that emphasis. And then we found that the players got really good at those exercises as well. So in terms of the feedback from the iPads or from the band, the setup that we had, so we had one band per iPad, for those of you that haven't used the, the push band before, um, and one iPad per exercise. Um, there's loads of ways that you could do it, but this is the way that we did it. So like I said to you before, the iPad is either mounted on the rig or just held by, um, held by their partner or their spotter. In terms of the strength exercises, the kind of data that we were looking at was the average velocity of the rep. Okay, so each rep they're doing, we're looking at the average speed of that lift. So again, if we think back to that force velocity curve, 
if we're trying to train in a certain zone, we know that those reps or those exercises need to be hitting a certain target. Uh, there's loads of different ways you can use the software where you, where you kind of have a noise to, to kind of signal that you've hit that, that target per rep or if you've fallen below a threshold, it might be a different sound or it might go red. Um, again, by the, the other players or their, their buddies reading out those scores, they knew that they were kind of in that zone. And sometimes it just takes a little bit of a push, a little bit of feedback. And if they weren't in that zone, then the next rep, you know that the quality and the intent was there so that you kind of knew you were, you were hitting the right, the right velocity there. And also you can have rep by rep in there. So we could look at consistency within the set as well. So that was the great thing about the, the feedback or the reflection after they'd done their set is we were able to kind of pick out whether it was five reps or 10 reps and go, yeah, look at your consistency across your lifts. So again, it goes down to the, the coaching cues, the quality, Whereas, you know, we have got just the first two reps that are really good. The third one was a bit lower. The fourth one's really high. So we try to kind of create some, some good consistency within their lifting as well, which I think just overall in the bigger picture just made them better lifters as well and made them stronger. Because if you think about it, you want the player to kind of control their loads as best as, as they can. In terms of moving towards the power and speed exercises, we didn't just look at the um, average of the rep or the set, we looked at their peak velocity. So when you want that kind of high power output, we were then able to look at the, the peak velocity of those reps. Um, and that really kind of helped us and helped the players um, within the competition in there. And again, with the, the use of EBT, like I said at the start, within the kind of um, reasons we used it, this encourages athletes, encourage athletes to stay in their zone. So you know that your training is directed um, and you're hitting the, the right zone and the, and the right goals. You know your goals are being achieved. So in terms of, um, I just put this little picture on, on screen. Um, so this for me is where, where I've kind of worked with athletes before. Um, and, you know, a lot of them, I call them sheep because they just follow each other around sometimes. So um, within my experience, just, just working in strength and conditioning um, and within a team environment, you, you kind of get, you get within the gym, you get your little small groups together, you get your, your packs, your buddies, you know, might be uh, just partners who, who get on really well. Not everyone's going to get on well, but sometimes players, you know, they like to go around small groups. And I found that if I or one player put a weight on, on the bar, then the next person coming in, oh yeah, he's lifting it, so I'll, I'll lift it as well. And for them, in their head, they were kind of like, well, I'm doing my work, so, you know, I must be doing something right. Um, but really, we wanted the, the training to be quite individual. So then if they were going in to lift and it's their turn, you know, how can you push yourself? Are you lifting the right weight? And with, it, with that feedback that we were given, we were able to say, now look at your feedback here. You're going quite quickly here. Could we get a bit more load on the bar? And that's where, you know, the kind of education, and the culture came into, into the weight room. And with the use of, of the feedback and the VBT, we were able to kind of educate the players. Um, and I thought that was quite kind of common with, within my environment. So um, I, I thought it was great that they were working together in small groups. I really wanted to encourage it, but it got me thinking of how could we kind of maximize that? You know, could we make it a bit more competitive? So in terms of player buy-in then, so when the players came into the gym, we just got them to do our traditional mobility exercises and the warming up rather than going straight into it. And we get them to do just a couple of warm up sets just to get the feel for the bar, making sure that the technique is spot on, they're engaging their core, um, and then they're kind of feeling good, ready for the lift rather than just going straight into a trap bar or a hex bar and starting to lift. Um, within our rep ranges, so reps and sets, we try to keep it consistent again. Um, now there's so many ways again for strength training that you can you know get adaptation you can start to go really really heavy you know uh, five sets of two and three etc cluster sets like I said to you before there's the, there's so many ways you can do it we we thought um, to, we wanted to keep it quite simple so we were, we were doing three sets of five we felt that we were getting a good enough dose we were getting probably enough volume with that as well and within those five reps we were able to see the kind of feedback or the quality of the lifting uh, from the push bands there. So 
Uh, after their two sets of their warm up, they'd go into three working sets then of the, of the exercises that we put out on the program. So hopefully within those two warm up sets, they could find their individual zone. So um, if it was a max strength phase we're working on, you know, within those warm up sets, they might just do a kind of um, incremental loading pattern where they go, right, I'm just going to try and find within my two sets. I roughly know what I lifted in the last session. So can I then get back up to that? Um, and as long as I'm in the right zone there, as long as my velocity output is correct for the training zone that I'm trying to hit, I know that when I come to my three working sets, I know that I'm training the right zone. And again, that education came in with the players. They started to get used to um, you know, lifting the right weights and not just following each other or, or lifting what the player before lifted. Also, I'd like to point out that the players weren't strong every day. So with the, the factor of fatigue, you know, coming in with, with the demand on field for, for pushing the players, not only for performance, but for development. You know, the, the training outputs are so high in football these days. They're, they're asked to sprint constantly now, change direction, decelerate at high forces. So, you know, every, every session that we had, we knew that we weren't going to get, you know, the best quality out of them, which kind of goes back to when I talked about catching in on the session. So we knew that one day, He's not going to be as strong as his last session. However, he's still going to be training within that zone, even if the load was slightly less than last time. Um, but because the fatigue is setting in, his velocity might be a bit slower. So he's not always going to be fast and explosive. We didn't throw the players straight into the deep end. So we didn't start, start straight away at trying to get um, below 0.5 meters per second on the max strength lifts. We might have kind of worked around 0.7 or 0.8 just so that they can get some familiarity with the, with the exercise, get comfortable. Um, if it was an exercise that we hadn't done before or, you know, had a, if it was the kind of, if we hadn't done track bar in the off season, we were kind of re, re kind of, um, you know, going back to that, that exercise, then we kind of worked towards it. So we might have spent maybe two or three weeks um, just with like a little um, introduction to that, that phase where the load was slightly less and the speed was slightly higher. But then as the, as the player got confident at lifting and got a bit stronger, then we were able to kind of really cash in on those, on those kind of sessions there. So in terms of the principles within finding the right load, so really, really simple. If it's too fast, if the output's from the, the velocity-based um, device that you're using, if it's too fast, then we could say to the player, increase the load. There straight away, you know, I've got evidence on the iPad. I'm going, look, it, it shows me here that you're, you're lifting really, really fast, you're nice and explosive. If we want you to be training within that zone, then can we increase that load? So then it kind of like, it gave us a little bit of a buy-in to the player and a bit of confidence for them as well. And if it was too slow or the fatigue was kind of creeping in, we could just say to them, look, I think you should maybe take a little bit off that, off that bar there. So, you know, we knew that we were getting the right loads and also the players. And just another way that you can, you can look at, um, the VBT train is just look at the velocity loss as well. So on some occasions, um, and especially towards the, the busier or the business end of the season where you've got lots of games coming in with the two game, game a week model, you might go in the gym and you don't want to fatigue the players too much. Uh, they might have already played during that week. So you can use some um, velocity cutoff, cutoffs or some velocity loss percentage, percentages. So in terms of, um, you know, 20% of their first rep or their best rep. So if there's a loss of 20% from their first rep or their best rep, then you can set the software to go red or to kind of alert the player to go, yeah, you are losing speed here. Um, so you, could, you should probably stop lifting. So we could then say to the player, right, yeah, you've done, you've done three reps of your load or you've done, you've done five reps, you don't need to do any more because it's showing now that you're, you're losing velocity or you've lost velocity by 20%. So fatigue is coming in. And if there's more than 20%, then it could be a bit damaging to the muscle um, and fatigue could set in. So when we're trying to minimize fatigue within a busy games uh, schedule program or a busy week, then that was a really kind of useful tool for us as well. And also players might be coming into the gym and reporting fatigue as well. And if, if they were coming and going, look, coach, I'm looking, I'm feeling a bit tired today. That's where we go back to saying, look, I still want to try and get a minimum dose of strength in there for you, but I'm going to set it to a velocity loss now. And I want you to 
I want it to just lift until you can, until your, your speed drops or your velocity drops. Um, and I think there, there was a massive psychological effect uh, and a positive one for the player because then they kind of knew that you were looking after the player and they weren't coming in going, oh, I've got a lift today. You know, you kind of, you, you gave them a little bit of a, a bit of a challenge. You gave them a, a little bit of a deal um, and you kind of, you got your win from it and they got their win as well. So it was, it kind of enabled us to train smarter. Um, for those of you that have kind of worked with players before as well, um, you probably see that the first rep is, is normally, um, you can go either way. It can be a really, really good rep. Um, you can come straight out of the blocks with your, with your lift, or it might come, you know, it might, you might get your, your best rep after your second rep. So you can set things to go, right, 20% loss of your first rep or your best rep. Um, and sometimes it might not be the, the rep straight after that one um, because you could find that a player picks it back up. So you might go, right, do you know what? If I've had two reps after my best rep or my first rep that are, that are below 20%, if there's on two occasions that have dropped below um, or sorry, more than 20%, then I know that my player is fatiguing. So I'm going to tell them to stop exercising or stop doing their, their, their set there. So in terms of creating a bit of competition within the gym, so this is where I think it's really powerful just having that feedback um, and using those small groups within the gym. So some of the things we used, um, so who can get the highest peak velocity? So you, know, you can have things like smart, uh, smart boards within the gym, you can have TV monitors, uh, as simple as getting the player to just get a, get a pen on the whiteboard and just writing down the, the highest velocity of their reps. So, if it's a, maybe a, a, a squat jump, you might say to the player, right, within your three reps, just put down your, your best rep, chuck it on the board, and then the next player comes in, right, he, he's beat him, so we might have a, a new leader or we kind of look at it towards the end. If it's three sets of three, it might be on your last set that you get your peak, so we take your best score. There's certain things that you can do, like you can have a bell in the gym, you can ring the bell anytime someone kind of um, hits a new uh, PB or the, the, the most um, or the highest score, the peak velocity. And we just use those peak velocities in those PAP sessions or those, um, you know, those kind of power exercises or the, the strength speed or speed strength exercises. And just another example of where we used it with the max strength and looking at the average velocity. You might have two players with a, a similar body mass or body composition it might be two players that are really pally in the same position but they like to push each other so they might be lifting the same load so if they're looking if they're lifting the same load some sort of individuality there or a bit of competition might be to go right you're lifting the same load who can get the the peak lift or the, the peak score from from your lift or if we're looking at the average who can get um the best average um average score um, or average velocity from that rep or who can get the best average um, set so if I've done my five reps and I'm going to write my average is, is the best at this weight um, there's just certain ways that you can kind of get a little bit of buying and a bit of competition and just that little image at the bottom there is just a little example obviously I've had to just blank out the player names and pictures there but in terms of a leaderboard you can get that straight away from from the app so you can have that on an iPad or you can rig it up to a monitor and you can have that in the gym straight away. And that was just an example from a little drop jump that we did where we had the band around the waist and we were just looking at speed off the ground. So how quickly could they get off the ground looking at peak velocity and meters per second there. And we could also send that around to the players as well. We could send that to the coaches. We could highlight that, okay, this player was the quickest this week or he's really, really improved his peak velocity over the last few weeks because we've been tracking him um, if it's a player that's, that's solely trying to become more explosive and trying to get some good stiffness in there, again, we could use this for the coach and for the player feedback and go, yeah, look at your scores here. You're actually improving here with the training. And again, we know that the training that we're doing, um, we know that it's kind of like it's, it's ticking the right boxes, it's doing the right thing. So just a few little um, examples of, of where we, we looked at the training over um, not so much over time, but just straight away feedback. Maybe when we got back into, into the office and we got the portal up, so the push portal, and we looked at the, the players' um, reps and sets. 
So you can do this straight away with the iPad, so you can have that straight away, or this is something that you can look at, you can go back and look at some reps. So this top one here uh, was a, a bench press from a max strength phase, so just barbell bench press. And on this day, I think we just chucked in, right, rather than doing three sets of five, we'll do three sets of three, and we'll just kind of increase the weight a little bit. So again, we're just trying to change in the stimulus a little bit for the players, but using um, the same exercises. Uh, I think we had a set average of 0.45 um, with a load of 70 kilograms. So you can see there on the top image, you've got three sets, the same load, different velocities, um, but you can kind of see that within there, the average um, that we were hitting the, the right zone there. And that was useful for the player as well. And that might have been a load that he hadn't lifted before. So maybe he might have been lifting a sort of 60 or 65 kilograms and the velocities were slightly higher. But then we go, right, do you know what? Let's get a bit of weight on the bar. Um, let's push you a little bit more. And then we can go, look, you can lift this weight in this zone. So this, this is probably the load on a good day. Um, and we know that you're still hitting the right zone there. So it gave the player a bit of confidence. And you can see there that um, at the end, or the last set, is actually his best velocity scores. And we did find that there was a bit of kind of uh, potentiation within um, within the sets that they were doing. So for many of you that, that work out yourselves that you probably find after a couple of sets that you've done, you know, you've got more muscle recruitment, more activation within the muscle fibers. So you'll, you'll probably find that, you know, after a couple of sets, you will feel a little bit better. And again, that is just something, or that's just um, another way of, uh, of highlighting that with the use of velocity-based training. The below image there, I think it was more of a, we worked along uh, the curve there. So I think it was a, strength speed um, so we were, we were working a little bit quicker so um, velocities are probably 1 to 1.3 so we had an average um, I think set average there of 1.12 so we knew that the player was in the right zone there so this player it may just drop in the load slightly but moving it rather quickly and you can see there that his last set was a little bit lower within um, within, within the velocity so Again, it just shows how pairs are different, how they react to different stimuluses. But again, with this feedback, we were able to then maybe adjust the sets or the load moving forward. Or if they're feeling a little bit fresher, they might be able to do the same load again and they might be able to hit higher velocities. So I think without this feedback, we wouldn't really know if we were training at the right zone or hitting the right targets or um, you know, having the right load on the bar. So it gave the player confidence, it gave us confidence that we knew that we were doing the right thing. Just another example of um, some outputs here. So working with a bit more speed, so more speed strength. So some velocity speeds of one to 1.3 meters per second. This, is on a, this was on a barbell step up. So we did 10 reps, but we did five on the left, five on the right. Now there's certain ways you can set this up on there. You can do right step ups on the left side, I'll do that first and I'll do step ups on the right side. We just found it a little bit quicker to do all 10 reps and then we know that right as long as you did your left leg first, your first five reps would be your, your left side. Um, and again within those 10 reps you can kind of see right did my first, did, was my left leg slightly weaker than my right so that was quite a nice lefty right comparison with the feedback. Um, with this type of exercise we were looking at a lower load but a fast movement Hence why um, the velocities were sort of like one minutes per second, going a little bit uh, quicker to 1.3. We knew that within those reps, they were consistent. So there's not much variation there. There's a few reps that are a little bit quicker. Um, but then again, it could be a player, if it's a step up exercise, they might have been pushing off of the rear foot a little bit more. But again, it was just another kind of little way to know that we were training in the zone. And within that education, the players knew that they had been working on different exercises at different speeds. Now they knew that they were working within that speed strength zone, that they knew that they had to move these, these bars a little bit quicker. And in terms of performance tracking, so this is just another way that you can pull out the data using the portal. So going back to the, the bench press example, so this is just an average velocity across sessions. So Within that kind of blue box there, you can see that they're the same load that was lifted, okay, but there was um, a faster velocity. All right, so the second time that player did it um, across a week or across sort of two weeks, 
second time they did it, or maybe the uh, third time they did it, their velocity was a lot quicker. So that tells us straight away that our player is getting stronger, that they're, they're lifting the same load, but they're lifting it quicker. So that is an indication that the player is getting stronger. And okay? so he's got a, his rate of force development is a lot quicker, um, and he's really going to sort of like reap the rewards from that. In the red box, it just shows that, you know, fatigue plays its part day to day or week to week, month to month, that players aren't always strong. So that was a, an example there where his load was the same, but his velocity was a lot lower there. Okay, so this could be a little uh, marker that he was fatigued. Fatigued, um, it'd be interesting to see. I think you can actually see with the last bar there, same load, um, and that was quicker than the, the previous session there. Okay, so straight away with the performance tracking, you're getting some little wins for the player and also for the coach. This is something that we were able to show the coach and we could go, yeah, look, he's done these sessions now. He's lifting the same load. Here's where he's getting quicker with the velocity. Um, so he's getting stronger. Once he demonstrated this a few times, okay, he's increased his load and then he's also lifting that a bit quicker as well. So straight away, the bigger picture, the player's getting stronger in that exercise. And I must point out the sort of the, the, ease, of, the ease of use with the, uh, with the portal and the software, we wanted to try and move away from kind of uh, paper-based programs. You know, I've used those over time and trying to work out kind of percentages um, and the loads to lift that day. You know, this was, the session was put on the board for them. They knew that they had to come in and, and find their velocity zone and they knew that they had to train in that zone. And then we were able to look back at the feedback, whether it was straight away in the session or when we got back to the office, um, and then we could look at that sort of longitudinal uh, progression over time within those exercises. And then just moving on to um, how you can sort of like work with your athletes when, when you're not with them. So I think this current situation with the coronavirus where it's been so difficult for us practitioners to work with our players. So um, there's an option you know, to remotely coach them using, using the app, using the software, so you can push um, exercises and strength sessions straight to them. Um, and hopefully with that education they've built up, they know exactly those types of exercises. They know what they're called. Um, but also there's a little feature on there as well where you can link the exercise up to a YouTube video. Um, and it might be a video that you've, got, you know, you've taken yourself and you can put your coaching cues in there as well. So the example of just a little power workout there that I put together for the players um, in terms of supersets, you can break it up into supersets, you can put all your reps and sets in there. And it doesn't always have to be with a band. So this could be all stuff without a band. Um, you know, you, you're not always going to um, have the opportunity to use the band if your player's not with you. So I think in an ideal world, Every player would have a band and they could, they could take that with them wherever they went. So if, if, they, if you couldn't travel with the player, um, you know, they could also take that with them and you could get that data straight away. They're back from the portal, from the online portal, or you, know, you could do stuff without it. Um, and in certain ways, you can kind of check that they're doing the sessions. So when they're working through that set, they can, they can check it off as soon as they've done it. Um, you can look at the session time. So you can look at how long it took them to do it, you can also look at how hard they found it with the RPE. So you can actually, once the session is finished, once they've completed all the exercises, they can plug in a little RPE and you can track that over time as well. And you can also get active time. So, you know, straight away, you know that the player isn't cheating and not just ticking off the exercises as they go. They, you know, by the active time, that, yeah, they've taken the time, they've done the, the rest periods that they need to. You know, if the session's about a 30, 40 minute session, you should have some active time on there. So that's the sort of way you can, you can use the remote coaching, which we found really, really useful. And we might get players that are on um, international duty. So um, they might be away. Some, many players do strength work with their, with, their, um, with their international teams, you know, with their home countries, which is fine. And I'm sure that coach, coaches liaise and, and make sure they're doing the right thing. But... Again, if they're away, it might be the off season, it might be a Christmas. So Christmas is a great time where the players have 10 days off and we're, we're able to kind of push exercises or push um, gym sessions towards the players and they can do it straight away. So we have that contact, we have that interaction with, with the players as well. 
and also it, it's just got the the tool of, of kind of um, scheduling and being organized so moving away from you know the excel kind of spreadsheets or the excel uh, periodization document you can actually put all your sessions in a calendar um, you can plot your days you can plot your fixtures like you can see in that example um, you can plot the type of work you can see when the player has done the exercises when they've logged in and again this is great to show the coaches because you can you can show them an individual's um, calendar and you can go look you can see how many sessions he's done there so the work is getting done and you can also just determine right he doesn't need to do much work on that day because he's done something previously or he's played a game previously so um, so I, I really really found it useful um, to, to do that so so there so that's the end of uh, my presentation uh, guys um, I hope you found that useful um, I think Cedric and Bailey are just gonna hop on now um, and if you've got any questions then yeah Liz. Cool. No, really appreciate that, Sam. Um, amazing information, uh, really detailed. I hope everyone got um, something great out of it. Um, it's, yeah, it's just really cool to see, um, you know, how you've set up your system and how you've been implementing it with your players. So it's been great. Thank you again for your time. Um, no so what I'll, do, what I'll do is um, I'll start reading out some of the questions now. Um, just so that everyone know, knows, so we're, we're going to do a follow-up email to this and we are going to upload this webinar uh, the entire recording onto our YouTube channel as well. So if you've missed anything, if you've got any slides that you want to see, you can just access it, um, which, and we'll be providing the link in the email that we send out to. Um, okay, so we'll start with the Q&A. So we'll start with something general. Um, just so that people know, what's the age group that you work with and are the strategies that you outlined in the presentation used universally across the club? Um, so I currently work with the under 23 uh, development squad um, at the academy. So um, ages kind of range from under, what do you say, under, under 17 up to under, under 20. Um, so we have players playing across uh, squads. So we might get sort of slightly younger players or slightly you know, uh, mature players. Um, and this is just something this season that we've, we've brought into the development squad um, and this isn't a way that we that we train all of our players we're gradually trying to implement the velocity based training within our kind of off field philosophy um, and there's certain ways where we think well we could get some some little bits of exposure to the maybe more younger age groups in terms of um, some technique work or just we might just chuck in one exercise to their to their program just to expose them so that when they do develop, once they come up to maybe the older age groups, then they've had some exposure and they've had some education within that. All right, great. Uh, so our next question here is, how would you alter the force velocity curve for an injured athlete? So essentially, how would you adapt your current training methods for, for longer term injuries like an ACL uh, reconstruction? Um, I think uh, we probably just have to check some, some baseline and we we probably wouldn't just go down and they, they wouldn't be able to lift what they what they previously lifted before um i think we, we probably i probably just look at a little bit more quality and control and i wouldn't go more down the sort of um the very max max strength load that the player could do so i might just sort of like add in a bit more speed taking off a little bit more load um for the player um, and once they become a little bit more competent, a bit more stable, depending on the injury, obviously, so an ACL injury, um, I think we could kind of like maybe work it with a little bit more load, a bit more max strength in there. And there's certain there's there's certain ways to do it. We might not necessarily use loss of base training straight away. We might just make sure they're at a competent level before we before we add that in. Um, but I kind of like to think that previously we kind of collected some velocity scores from that player. And then we kind of know that the targets that we need to kind of get them back up to. So I hope that answers the question. Perfect. Yeah. Great answer. Um, so we had a number of people writing in just to just about this topic. So I think we can kind of catch a few questions with this one. So uh, could you outline uh, what a PAP session is or a PAP session? Um, and yeah. how, how would you yeah. use velocity uh, specifically to prescribe, um, to prescribe loads during, during this, uh, during this session? Yeah, good question. Um, so the PAP sessions, so uh, post-activation post -act potentiation. So 
if it's the day before a game, um, there's some research out there that you know, like the day before the game, you can you can get some really good potentiation um, for the players, and we'd like to do some kind of explosive type uh, pap exercises. So some of the ones we've done, we've done some little eccentric exercises, um, some concentric exercises. Uh, we might do an eccentric into a concentric. Um, we might do some ballistic med ball slams, some med ball throws, might be some vertical throws. There might be some, some drop jumps in there as well. And we probably wouldn't focus too much on uh, the velocity for um, that, that play or that session. I think the main reason being is the, the pre-training sessions are quite short. So they're normally around kind of 15 to 20 minutes prep before they go out and start their warm up. So we wouldn't really have time to find the load for each individual athlete. So we might just keep the, the load relatively um, standard. Uh, so if it was maybe like a barbell split jerk, um, like a push, uh, yeah, just a push jerk, we might just kind of like stick maybe 30, 40 kilograms on there and everyone do the same load, but see who can kind of shift it uh, the quickest. If there's a player, obviously, that is struggling a little bit and they're nowhere kind of, they're very, very low within their velocity scores, we might say to them, right, let's just reduce the load for it. Or we might just group our athletes. We might just go, look, we know these are kind of big, powerful athletes. We can kind of go put this, put this load on there that we know they've lifted before. Um, some of the sort of smaller technical uh, players, we might just sort of adjust their load and maybe have two set, two stations open up. But purely because of time, we wouldn't really kind of set out um, each individual velocity um, zone or load for that player. I think we kind of save that for our, our afternoon sessions. Great. Um, so, so Sam, how do you test readiness and what do you use to do so throughout the week? Um, so for our readiness, we've got a, a current batch. Uh, we look at some neuromuscular fatigue on the four steps. So we look at the CMJ. Um, so we just look at those sort of like um, explosive mechanical properties of the CMJ and just see how they kind of change um, week on week or day, day by day, depending on, on the schedule when they're played. Um, we do some adductor squeezes. So we do some groin squeezes to look at kind of like power output to see if um, dropped off in certain positions and we obviously look at that longitudinally as well to see whether the player is fatigued and dropping off uh, we do like a well-being questionnaire as well so just do some generic well-being questions in there um, and i think that's all we do at the moment yeah just kind of three areas that we that we look at um, and in there so Perfect. Okay, cool. So the next one is, um, how have the athletes responded to instant feedback during their sessions? And from a cultural perspective, what were the key learnings or findings that you guys uh, found using, um, using VBT? Um, so how did they find the feedback? Yeah, so I, I think the feedback really, really helped just to have that, that feedback straight away. I, I felt as if it motivated the players. So, you know, if you've got that score coming up, on, on the iPads, then you kind of, you know, we wanted to, for each rep we wanted, we wanted to sort of maximum in, intent that they, they could produce on that day. So, you know, by having having that feedback of the rep straight away, you know, we're saying to them, right, can you push even harder? You know, can you go quicker? Can you get a quicker score? And, you know, they, they found that sort of like inter-rep um, variability that some were a little bit lower, but then all of a sudden they, they managed to have a, a bit more effort and they pushed straight back up there. So, you know, we had a really, really good vibe in the gym. We had players kind of geeing each other on and, and really getting them going. So that just kind of, you know, the intent was there and the quality was there. Um, and what's the last part of the question, Bailey? Sorry. And then, yeah, and what, what were kind of the key cultural learnings um, that you found, uh, you know, using VBT? Like how, like what, what effects on the environment and in general did you, did you see after implementing it? I think it just improved the environment and it improved um, the, the weight room kind of culture. So, you know, we had players, they did their training session and, and they thought that they, you know, okay, I'll just go and do my gym session and I'm done, I'm going to go home. Um, but we, you know, right, like I said to you, in the, like I mentioned in the presentation, we had a, um, some kind of like quick strength circuits in there that were good, but we kind of found that we, we slowed things down by putting them into smaller groups and because we could everyone going at the same time within within the band so 
think the, the environment changed where when they were working, they were really, really working. When they were resting, they knew that they were resting for a reason. Um, and that kind of culture changed uh, with the education where uh, they knew that what they were doing was the right thing. Um, and with that feedback straight away, they knew um, that they were kind of like working in the zone. So when they left the weight room, they knew that they gave everything they got. Um, they knew that they were working in the right zone and they were working towards the goal that we were trying to achieve. And whether that was from an individual point of view or whether that was from a team point of view, um, I think it really, really helped just to, to kind of you know, get, some, get some feedback and educate the players as to why we're doing it. Fantastic. So our next question comes from uh, Craig. And what does the minimum dose of strength look like in terms of sets, reps, percentage of 1RM and exercises or number of exercises? Um, so, good, yeah, good question. So I think there's no right or wrong for that. So there's sometimes where we kind of felt, you know, I know some coaches, they might just do two lower body exercises. It might just be like, a, a, it could be a hamstring exercise. It could be a glute and a knee dominant exercise where they're just going a couple of sets. Um, you know, they might do two sets of five each leg. Um, and I've seen some, some coaches uh, within the, the professional, within the environment, they, they might just do that game and they might come in a change room. You see some, some players and some teams doing some strength exercises because they're going into, they might have a day off the next day. So you know, that was their way of just getting their minimum dose in without fatiguing the players. And I think it's down to personal preference, really. If you've got some players that recover really, really well, if they've, if they've been working on strength training for quite a while and they've, you know, they can adapt quite quickly, um, we, we found that our players do adapt to training every day and strength training every day. So you know, we use the readiness, we use the, uh, the jump testing to see you know, where were their kind of drop-offs. But we knew the players would adapt quite quickly to it. So we would do our, our core lifts, so we would do our two exercises and it might be the, the couple of sets when we knew that we had a busy schedule. I think in terms of percentage one RM, probably around sort of 70, 80%. So not, not heavy, probably towards maybe the, the 70% range, um, just so you're not overdoing it. Um, that kind of worked, worked for us. Um, and I was confident I wasn't pushing, pushing the players too much. Awesome. Great answer, Sam. Um, so we want to be respectful of uh, Sam's time. We, uh, we, we've still got about 100 questions in the Q&A. <laughs> so um, we'll, we'll ask two more. And then if anyone has any follow-up questions, we'll be including, me and Bailey will be including our emails in the follow-up email. So if you have any questions for Sam, just shoot them to us and we'll be sure to forward them on. Um, okay, so we'll go for the second last question just now. Uh, more of a general question. How are you using velocity-based tra uh, training for load management? Um, so probably going back to that slide where we're looking at uh, we're tracking across across time so when we're, we're seeing the player looking at you know if they're lifting the same load and we're seeing that their velocity is dropping each time and it's not really picking back up then you know we, we kind of know there's a bit of fatigue coming in there in terms of um, individual load management if it's a player it depends on the injury or sorry not an injury but if it's it depends on kind of where we're trying to manage that load so if it is like if it's an adductor problem that, that's coming up and we need to really manage that load there. If it's, um, if it's a tendon issue, you know, it, I think it's all about just changing the type of exercise and even going, you know, within the program that we used, if, if it was the set core lifts that everyone was doing, there, there's, there's no kind of set way that we're going like, yes, you have to do this. We're going to, we're going to kind of like monitor, we're going to modify that individual and we might give them something completely different, but there, there could be um, another way of still using velocity. So, you know, with the versatility within, within the bands, you know, you can, you can add it to lots of exercises. You know? So if it was, if you didn't want to, to kind of load the, the knees, you know, you might want to go into like a glute bridge and you can still put the band on the bar and you, you can kind of push through and work the glutes instead. So, you know, that's just another, the bands can be used and you can kind of manage that load for the player. Fantastic. Uh, so this is going to be our last question. Uh, using CMJ, adductor squeeze and wellness questionnaires, do you have any standards at which you alert sport coaches or decrease volume slash intensity? 
Maybe an example would be using acute to chronic ratios to establish cutoffs for increasing or decreasing training volume. Yeah, so um, we kind of do it in a few ways. So we use, uh, I think a lot of uh, teams or clubs are doing it, but in terms of GPS data, we would use an acute chronic load with that. So we know that the on-field work that they're doing, um, we could use that um, as a load uh, management tool. So when a player has gone into their threshold where there is a, a bit of a risk to injury, looking back historically, how much work have they done? Has there been loads of high speed work that they've done lately? Um, so that is, that's just one way that it can be used. And then we kind of coincide that with the, the readiness uh, data that we collect, the CMJ. Um, so we kind of use it all together. Um, we don't want to kind of go or I don't want to go, yeah, okay, he's, he's, down on, he's down on this, but he's up on this. You know, he might be okay to train. You know, the best thing we're trying to do is we want that player to train. So even if he is struggling a little bit, he might be able to still train because there's, you know, he, if he had a, a poor night's sleep, you know, it doesn't mean he can't train. He might just adjust what you do. So I think you really have to use all these pieces of the, of the puzzle and, and piece it together to really kind of get the, get the overall picture of where your, your athlete is at. So we wouldn't just use one, one piece of uh, data, we would use it all together. And is there any trends coming, coming there? And I think we wouldn't go to, as, condition, as a conditioning coach, I wouldn't go to a coach and go, look, scores are down, it's not training. You know, we want to try and keep those players training as much as we can. If it's a circumstance where we think, right, you know, he, he's, he's got an injury, he's got a notch, not, we don't want to make it any worse, then we could go, yeah doesn't need to you know, it should be training um but we're kind of we could put some recommendations in place to the coach and say you know looking at his well-being his well-being's down he's pretty tired he's pretty fatigued this is linking in with his cmj and his adductor squeezes could be modified that player slightly so he might come out and do part of the warm-up um we want to try and prioritize the on-field training so could he do part of the training and then he might not lift in the afternoon I think that's just a nice way of, of managing your players. Um, you know, he might just do some upper body in the afternoon and kind of catch up later on in the week once he's fully recovered. Really awesome information, Sam. Um, okay, so we'll, we'll end it there. And um, like, like I said, I just want to thank you again, Sam, for your time, um, you know, taking, taking the time to present. We've got, we've got a huge international crowd that's, uh, that's signed in, um, you know, and asking many, many questions. And it's just been, it's been really, really great. Um, so, like, like me, like me and Bailey mentioned, we'll be uh, we'll be uploading the, the webinar on YouTube, we'll be sending out a follow up email. If you have any questions, get in touch with us uh, on the emails that we'll provide in the in the follow up email. And hope that you guys all stay safe and stay tuned for our next one uh, next Friday. Thank you again, everyone, and thank you again, Sam. Cheers, guys. Thanks for listening. Thanks. Bye bye. Cheers, bye. -bye.